Uh, so today's a, kind of a hard day to pick what to preach about. It was. Um, what I'm not going to preach about, but I just want to mention very briefly, is that really the main thing our gospel is trying to get at is almsgiving. And in the gospels, uh, Jesus today talks about storing up uh, grain, which in the ancient world is wealth. And so it's like this big savings account that this rich man has today. And in the Gospels, that's contrasted explicitly with almsgiving, which is a way that you and I can store treasure in heaven. Um, but that's for another homily. If you want a book on that, there's two books I'm going to mention today that have changed my life. Uh, the one for that, we have copies in our narthex. It's called Charity. It's about the poor and almsgiving in the life of a Christian, and it'll change your life. We'll get to the other one in a minute. Okay, well, today, though, what I, what I really want to reflect with you about today and dive into, uh, first off, when today's first reading comes up, we have Ecclesiastes, and don't you always feel bad for the lector? <laughs> I'm like, poor Stefan today. It's like... Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. And then the last line of today's first reading says, this too is vanity. The word of the Lord. <laughs> right? And then today's gospel is basically like, well, you've got all these good things, but you're going to die. The gospel of the Lord. <laughs> Why do we come to church? Okay. So today, though, we're going to dive into that. And today what I want to talk to you about is that uh, Jesus Christ is the answer to the riddle that Quoheleth has in our first reading. Quoheleth in the book of Ecclesiastes proposes a profound riddle that's part of human life. And it's answered by him. So I don't know if you've seen The Goonies. If you haven't, you're totally lame. The Goonies is like the, one of the quintessential movies of my generation. And anybody grow up, growing up in my time, we watched that movie like a million times. And the beginning of that movie, there's a family in Oregon, and there's a developer coming in. They're going to tear down all these houses and build a golf course. And the mother, Mrs. Walsh, uh, she's talking to the kids and she says, you know, I really want the house to be clean when they tear it down. And that's something of what Quoheleth is saying today. Vanity of vanities. You may have a clean house, but it's going to get torn down. So why clean your house? I feel this in my own life. I know you all do too. It's like, someday I'm going to die, and if you think of the people after you, this is a big part of that first reading, Koholeth is distressed that the things you appreciate and worked hard for, and you grew in holiness and wisdom, that when you die, they're going to go to somebody who doesn't appreciate it. And I'm like, my books. <laughs> right? Someday I'm going to die and my library of books that have been like in some ways the most, you know, important part of my, well, they're not the most important, but they're an important part of my life. They're going to be in a bunch of books and some chump's going to just like, like eh, throw them out. And I, am I in, if I'm in heaven, I will be, look, well, I won't care. If I'm in heaven, I'll be like, all right, whatever. Um, <laughs> but it's a little distressing to me. Or more proximate in my life is someday I'm going to get moved from Lourdes. And priests try really hard when we get moved. Uh, it's really hard to let go of a parish you love. Don't worry, this isn't an announcement. <laughs> but, but I'm like, who's coming after me? And I've worked so hard with so many of you to build this church up. And to make it a place where people encounter Christ and the gospel. And where you walk into Mass on Sunday and you can just feel the love of God in this place. And what's the guy after me going to do? Vanity of vanities. 
And we try to fight against it. And the way I've, one of the ways I've tried to fight against that at Lourdes is we made this altar weigh, you know, about half a billion pounds. So if somebody tried to move it, it's like, <laughs> good luck. <laughs> you can call me at my next parish. Um, we do this, don't we? And so today what I want to do, here's what I want to do with you. The resurrection of Jesus Christ resolves Quoheleth's problem. It resolves it. And we're going to dive into that today. Our second reading is very much about this. The riddle of all human life, right? Your, your pagan friends and your secular friends, right? They can run from that question for a long time, but at some point they will ask Quoheleth's question. Why have I labored so hard? I'm just going to die. Jesus, thank you that you have answered that riddle and you brought it to fulfillment. Today's readings can give the impression that as Christians, that we are men and women who abandon this world. And this is a mischaracterization of Christianity, but some of us as Christians do this. And I want to, want to dive into that. So throughout Christian history, one of the main accusations against us has been that we abandon this world for the next. And so in the year 248, Origen debates with a pagan named Celsus. And he writes this big book, Contra Celsus. And one of the main points of that debate is, are Christians to blame for the downfall of society when they abandon it because they love heaven? That's the year 248. In the 19th century, Frederick Nietzsche wrote a book called Thus Spoke Zarathustra, your favorite and mine. And he says this, that Zarathustra is a pagan prophet of sorts. Zarathustra comes into, into this town and he preaches and he says this, he says, I adjure you, my brothers, remain true to the earth. Remain true to the earth. And believe not those who speak to you of super earthly hopes. This is a message directed against Christianity. And Nietzsche believed, and Marx will follow him, by the way. This is the problem with communism. Marx believed the same thing. He follows Nietzsche. That essentially what happens is that Christians lie to people. And they say, hey, you know what? You don't have to be happy in this life. Look to heaven. And by that means, Marx says, the bourgeois oppress the proletariat. Back to Nietzsche, though. Remain true to the earth. Believe not those who speak to you of super earthly hopes. Poisoners are they, whether they know it or not. He goes on, one last line, he says, Once blasphemy against God was the greatest blasphemy, but God died, and therewith all those blasphemers. To blaspheme the earth is now the deadliest sin, etc., etc. Today, brothers and sisters, Jesus refutes Celsus, he refutes Nietzsche, he refutes Marx, and he brings the hope of Quoheleth and of all of us to fulfillment. And it's all about the resurrection. That's what it's all about. So the normal, one of the things that you and I get wrong sometimes is Christians. And when we get this wrong, brothers and sisters, the world has a legitimate critique of us. And the normal critique sometimes out there is that you and I, that Christianity is about, you know what, it's escapism. You're going to die someday, so forget about everything in this world and just set your heart on heaven. And our readings sound a little bit like that today. But that's a misread. And here's what it's truly about. The paradigm of Christianity and for your life, 
The paradigm is not escapism. The paradigm of Christianity is that God invades, breaks into, redeems, and transforms this world. That is Christianity. Christianity is not God taking us out of this world. It's Him reigning in this world. That's what Christianity is. So Koholas' word today, vanity, I looked up the Greek, the Greek word, matayotes, matayotes of matayotu, matayotes, vanity, Paul uses that word in Romans chapter 8. And here's what he says. Creation was subjected to matayotes, to vanity. It's usually translated as futility. And Paul here is referring to Genesis 3, when the curse that fell on Adam is shared by the earth. God says to Adam in Genesis 3, cursed is the ground because of you, and by the labor of your brow, it's going to bring forth thorns and thistles. Matayotes, vanity, futility. Creation was made subject to futility, not by its own will, but by the will, and here's the key line, hang with me, by the will of him who subjected it in hope. Who subjected it in hope. God subjected the world to futility, but in hope. Because creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the glorious liberty of the children of God. Here's what you and I believe in. We believe in the resurrection and the life of the world to come. In the ancient world, if you've been coming to Lourdes long enough, you've heard me say this, in the ancient world, everyone believes in heaven. Everyone does. Christians and Jews believe in resurrection. And no one else. And that was a weird thing in the ancient world. And here's what it means. Brothers and sisters, your body, if you live a good life, if you love him and you accept his redemption and his grace, your soul will not just go to heaven. That word in the scriptures really means the realm of God. It can also just mean the sky. Resurrection means your soul will be reunited with your body in glory. And the whole point of that is that God doesn't give up on this world. He doesn't say, well, I made my good creation, right? Our terrible stained glass windows that I've never liked, right? The seven days of creation, God says, it is good, it is good, it is good, it is good. God doesn't say at the end of that, yeah, you know, sin broke in and corruption, so... Let's just throw out that world and let's just have a non-bodily spiritual heaven. There's a word for that. It's called Gnosticism, which is a heresy. I believe in the resurrection and the life of the world to come. And here's where Nietzsche gets it wrong. Christianity is not God calling us to abandon this world. It is Jesus Christ conquering this world and redeeming it from the inside out. That's Christianity. And if I can say this right, brothers and sisters, if you can get what I'm trying to communicate this morning, this will change your life. This gets me out of bed in the morning. Today's homily, by the way, is sponsored by N.T. Wright. The book you should read about this is called Surprised by Hope. And that book is the other book that I wanted to mention today. Surprised by Hope is in my top five books in my life that completely changed my thinking on something. 
And T. Wright's not a Catholic, he's an Anglican, so we don't agree with everything. He doesn't understand purgatory. But his teaching on the resurrection is dead on. Here's what he says. So in 1 Corinthians 15, and think about this. This is going to transform your life. 1 Corinthians 15, St. Paul says this. And by the way, that chapter is the longest treatment of the resurrection in all of the New Testament. There's no section in the New Testament that talks about the resurrection more than 1 Corinthians 15. And at the end of that chapter, Paul doesn't say, so don't sweat it, relax, don't worry about this world because we're going to go to heaven. That's not what he says. The very last line of Paul's treatment of the resurrection, he says this, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. And hear this, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. You see, Quoholeth was wrong because he didn't know about the resurrection. Last point today, what I want to bring you to. In this world, and brothers and sisters, you are going to die. And that should bring you sobriety and wisdom. Right? You you can't, you know, I love my Ford Escape. I call it the Escape. (laughs) I came up with that myself. (laughs) I'm not going to have that car in heaven. Heaven, right? What heaven really means for the Christian is the day that God's will is done on earth. Thy kingdom Come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. On the last day when Jesus Christ transforms this world and reigns and is all in all, there are certain things that will no longer matter. Your bank account won't matter. Your waistline won't matter, brothers and sisters. Your pride, your vanity, your ego, these things will not matter. But the work you do in the Lord, that's the key, in the Lord will not be in vain. And here's what that means. Our little parish, I don't know that this building will be in heaven. In fact, I know it won't be. But I can tell you that the lives that you and I touch through the gospel... When you give yourself to your faith, when you love the poor, when you evangelize those who are away from God, when you bring justice and goodness to the world around us, when you bring beauty to a world that loves ugliness, that is carried into God's new creation. One image, and then, and then we'll try to finally end with, with Colossians. One of the most glorious buildings that's ever been built in the world is the Colosseum. But if you look at it today, if you go to Rome and see the Colosseum, the facade, the externals of the building look, it looks kind of drab. In the ancient world, it was covered in marble. But the Colosseum is a great image of this world. The Colosseum was a place of death. It was a place where Christians were eaten by lions, where the poor were persecuted for entertainment and for bloodlust. But when Christianity conquered Rome, the evils of the Colosseum were put to an end, and the marble of the Colosseum was stripped to adorn churches. 
In this world, the parts that are evil, on the last day, they will be condemned by Christ and cast out. But the things that are done in the Lord will be a part of God's new creation. Be steadfast, immovable, knowing that the work you do, the labor you work in the Lord, is not in vain. That gets me out of bed in the morning because I get to be a part of it. Right? That the hard days as a priest, which is like the ones that end in Y, right? The, the hard days I get through, not really, be a priest, we need you. Um, <laughs> but, but what gets me out of bed in the morning is that in some small way, right, Jesus, if my preaching is faithful, if my study is faithful, if my love for you is true and good, you can use it. And you allow me to be someone who works in a small way for your new creation. Jesus Christ is the answer to Koholeth. Today, go home, I'll leave you with this. Go home and read the second reading today. In Colossians, St. Paul in both chapters 2 and 3, today we heard in chapter 3, St. Paul there is talking about baptism. Very clearly, he's talking about baptism. And today you heard he says, put off the old man with his practices. And in the baptismal liturgy of the old church, of the ancient church, you were stripped naked. And your clothing that you were stripped of was symbolic of your old life, where you lived for the things of this world, the things that do not carry into God's new creation. You went full immersion into the waters, and you were baptized by the priest or the deacon. You came out the other side, and they put a white garment on you, which is why priests wear albs. The, I'm not trying to flash you. The white. It's my baptismal garment. And so Paul today says, you have put off the old man. In the baptismal rite, that was symbolic. You died with Christ. You put off the old man with his practices, and you have put on the new man. And that white garment was symbolic of your new life as a Christian. Brothers and sisters, Koholeth is wrong. It's worth wrestling with. You're going to die someday. And you will feel this. You will feel the things I have labored for, the difficult things. Is it all just vanity? But you're a Christian. And the answer is no. If it was done in Christ. Jesus, may we die to the things of this world that are earthly. May our sinful life be put to death. Jesus, may you make us steadfast, immovable, knowing that what we do in you is not in vain.